it's, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our uh, Country Risk Conference 2018 here in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I'm pleased to see so many attend, it was about 200 of us today. Uh, we come, we represent all sorts of industries. We have uh, company executives, we have some uh, uh, journalists, some faculty. It's a privilege and a pleasure for me to uh, see everybody gathered here today for this event. Um, you know, let me start by maybe saying a few things about COFAS and why we organize such meetings. I believe that COFAS uh, is today a reference in credit insurance, risk management, and we have a particularly interesting vantage point on the global economy. Just as a reminder, uh, COFAS is 4,100 experts. We serve 50,000 corporate clients uh, to build successful, growing, and dynamic businesses. Any day of the, of the year, we actually carry 520 billion euros of credit risk on about 3 million names across 200 countries around the world. Uh, our services and solutions are here to protect and help companies make credit decisions so that they can sell uh, both in their domestic market and in their export markets. Our clients, as I said, represent a wide variety of sectors and geographies, which I think give us a particularly interesting vantage point on the world economy. I, would li I like to say usually that uh, almost anything that happens in the economy actually impacts COFAS almost immediately. When you look at our balance sheet, it pretty much reflects a lot of the things that you read about in the papers. So what I want to do today is share our thoughts and exchange on what the risk environment looks like for the world as we come near to the end of 2018. But before we get into that, let me just say one more thing. This year, we have chosen as COFAS to assert our new identity and you may have seen uh, COFAS for trade. Um, this is uh, that of a human-sized multinational, which is agile, which is connected to the world of today, and which is capable of supporting you in all your developments uh, that are available throughout the world. This uh, trademark expresses our core belief that business is a force for good, that it contributes to prosperity, and to stability. It's an affirmative statement at a time when trade is facing, obviously, as you know, increasing protectionist and populist pressures all over the world. So I'm delighted to be here in Hong Kong, which is central in Asia, as it's pretty obvious. And you know the economy here is mainly reliant on mainland China's economy, and second, global trade. So these are going to be the two leading themes of the agenda of the conference. You'll hear from Zhu Haibin, who's a chief economist of JP Morgan. Uh, you'll hear from Alicia Garcia Herrero, who is a chief Asia Pacific economist for Natixis. And we will hear from Andrew Collier, managing director of Orient Capital Research. Billy Wong, deputy director of research for Hong Kong Trade Development Council and our own uh, chief economist here in the region, Carlos Casanova. Uh, and they will all be talking about risks relative to trade war, to China, and, and economic policies. And then after these distinguished speakers, we will have a panel which will be dedicated to businesses, and more specifically, on how companies are navigating credit risk and supply chain disruptions at this point. So, since China and the rest of Asia will be extensively discussed uh, by all the speakers that we have this morning, I'm going to focus my remarks on the global risk perspective as I see it from my vantage point as the head of COFAS globally. And the first thing I'd like to say to start is to say uh, that the global growth picture is actually pretty good. This year, global growth stands at an eight-year high with its three key engines working at the same time. First of all, the U.S. economy is booming. Growth is 
higher than 4% in the second quarter of the year. This is a level which a lot of emerging markets would like to get. Business confidence stands at a 14-year high in the manufacturing sector, thanks to um, the tax cuts uh, of the Trump administration, and despite the uncertainties which are related to global trade and, uh, and the U.S. Uh, dollar which is going up. Unemployment in the U.S. is at its lowest since 1969. In Europe, businesses continue to invest steadily and households consume decently, I would say. Business insolvencies are now lower than they used to be before the global crisis in most markets. And China, of course, as you know, is still doing quite well, at least in the headlines, and accounts for about 30% of the world growth this year. More generally speaking, the development of the middle class in the emerging world uh, we continue to see good demographic growth. The urbanization process is still underway and uh, continues to drive growth in a lot of areas around the world. So, you know, when you look at it on the surface, uh, actually it looks like the environment's pretty good. But despite all these good news, it turns out that, particular, uh, that businesses are more and more worried in Asia and in Europe in particular. And why is that? I think we are facing five main global risks at this moment, which could potentially derail this nice growth trajectory that we've been on. None of these, at this stage, in my opinion, is systemic, but nevertheless, they can have uh, major microeconomic and local impacts on businesses, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these five risks. Number one, which is obviously making the headlines these days, emerging markets. They've been in the spotlight because the cars have been redealt amongst the emerging world since we've met a year ago. On the one hand, oil exporting countries are suffering much less than a year ago because uh, obviously uh, black gold prices have gone up. On the other hand, this trend is of course bad news for commodity importers. Some of them are experiencing significant currency sell-offs this year. Uh, these currency sell-offs have been driven by domestic and external factors and they will have differentiated impacts across countries. Uh, the two countries that have been holding the headlines, Turkey and Argentina. Uh, in these countries, the large-scale depreciation of the lira and the peso is leading to a recession in the short term. And this is due to, on one hand, much higher inflation in both countries, it's above 20% in Turkey and above 30% in Argentina, actually. And we expect that inflation to continue to pick up in the coming months. Second, the increased amount in local currency of government and private debt, which is denominated in foreign currency, i.e. in US dollars mainly. And then we're seeing at the same time much tighter monetary and fiscal policies in both of these countries. For example, Argentina's government has announced fiscal tightening measures, whereas the key policy rate of the central bank has been hiked to 60%, and that's a pretty high, pretty high level. So, two obvious cases, but beyond these two extreme cases, there's more and more concern uh, about possible contagion to other emerging markets, and at this moment, the names that are coming back are Brazil, South Africa, India, and Indonesia, which seem most at risk because they share some of Argentina and Turkey's vulnerabilities. Their current account deficits require to be financed through capital inflows. They all have large and liquid local equity and bond markets that have benefited from large inflows of global liquidity coming from the very expansionary monetary policies in the US, the Eurozone, and Japan post the crisis years. Current and potential political uncertainties against the backdrop of some coming elections. We will have uh, elections in October in Brazil and in 2019 it will be South Africa, India and Indonesia. However, even though the risk of a currency crisis leading to a deep recession cannot totally be ruled out in these countries, this is not the COFAS's baseline scenario. 
These countries have much higher foreign exchange reserves than Turkey and Argentina, so they have more powerful tools to support their currency. If ever these tools are not powerful enough, the impact of a currency crisis on the economies of Brazil, South Africa, India, or Indonesia would be much less significant than in Turkey and Argentina. They are much less, much less dollarized economies. The share of public debt, which is denominated in foreign currency, stands below 10% in South Africa and, and in Brazil and India, while it's close to 70% in Argentina. So there are big differences between um, these countries and, and the two I mentioned earlier. The second risk I'd like to talk about is protectionism. Protectionist announcements of higher tariffs and trade barriers, particularly by the U.S. President, are another concern uh, on the world economy. I'm not going to say too much about this because this is going to be one of the topics which is going to be debated this morning. Admittedly, at this stage, uh, the direct impact of these measures seems manageable, even in China. I mean, the impact of a 10% tariff hike on 200 billion U.S. dollars of China's exports are partly offset already by the lower value of the RMB and by increased productivity. But I'd say the key concern uh, pertains more to the outlook. If President Trump announces so many protectionist measures while the U.S. economy is actually doing very well and the unemployment is low, uh, the question is, what could he do when the economy in the U.S. starts to show signs of weakness and as we get nearer to um, the presidential campaign season from mid-2019? Uh, I think we don't have the answer. We'll have to wait and see. The third risk um, I'd like to talk about is global debt. The, the global debt today is over, and I have to read the numbers because it's actually staggering, $230,000 billion, $230 trillion. That's more than 50%, more than it was 10 years ago. We all know from the what we've observed in Japan over the last uh, couple decades um, how difficult it is to change mentalities, to drag companies out of the vicious circle of stagnation once it is established, especially when it is driven by very high debt levels. In the late 90s, we uh, estimated that 20 to 25 percent of Japanese companies were what we call zombie companies, i.e. they could only survive due to easy monetary conditions, and they were too indebted to invest and grow. So we have been taking a look uh, in COFAS at what is the level of zombie companies and other economies, uh, particularly in Western Europe. And we believe that in Western Europe today, they account for 4 to 6% of companies in Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. And the Bank for International Settlements has just done a similar study. So we're not at the level that Japan used to know. But still, zombie companies will, they exist. And we know that in a period when interest rates will be going back up, there will be an impact on the economy. And, and we have to be aware of this. The, the fourth risk that I'd like to talk about is political risk. You know, the debt issue becomes particularly acute when it's combined with rising political risk, which um, if you take a look at Italy, uh, which has been making the headlines recently, um, where already, despite record-breaking debt, I would say, in Europe, and somewhat nervous investor sentiment, uh, the government wants to continue to drive and broaden the public deficit in the coming years. Another example is the UK. We are less than six months away from Brexit D-Day, and uh, we still don't know how this is going to work. If there's no deal, businesses will have to be prepared to face a shock. It will be higher tariffs in a number of sectors, including agriculture and automotive. Uh, it will be a confidence shock in the construction sector. And there will be significant inflation impacts in the retail sector, just to name a few of the potential fallouts from a no Brexit deal. So, so political risk is rising. And it uh, compounds the global geopolitical risk 
of conflict and terrorism. Uh, the number of armed conflicts in the world has doubled in the past 10 years. And in addition, we have created at COFAS, as you know, a global terror risk, risk index. Um, and uh, basically, it has been multiplied by three over the last 10 years. So clearly, political risk continues to increase. And then the fifth risk, which I think we are all facing in our industries, has to do with digitization and its impact on distribution channels. We all know that as a company, our activity is not only driven by the economic and political factors. A lot of things uh, are at play. Digital's been uh, happening for the last 20 years. Actually, Google is 20 years old. Uh, Amazon is 24. Apple is 42, so it's still pretty young companies. Already uh, trillion dollar market caps. Uh, even Facebook, which is the last one on the on the list, is, is 14 years old, is, is already a teenager. But it seems like things are accelerating in this space, right? Uh, and we all see it both as consumers, as citizens, uh, or in our professional lives. On the one hand, digitization um, causes new players to emerge. It also causes other players to disappear. And to me, that means that stronger growth does not necessarily mean less credit risk. This is obviously a pretty important point when, you, when you're when you in the business that we are in COFAS, which is protecting credit risk, right? So stronger growth doesn't mean lower credit risk. And I think a very good example of this is in the distribution sector. The What we call the Amazon revolution is affecting a very large number of traditional retailers and we see this happening everywhere around the world, whether it's in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in Italy, and even in emerging markets. I mean, we've seen a couple cases in Argentina, uh, which have been the first ones to be impacted uh, by, the, by the crisis that we know is happening there. So these are the five key risks that we see on the horizon. How can we help you manage and mitigate these risks? As you know, they keep me busy as the CEO of a global player of the credit insurance industry. The economy is doing pretty well, but we are facing risks. And we are here to monitor these risks on a day-to-day -day basis, anticipating them. And, uh, and, and it's actually not easy, because a lot of these risks are actually driven by the human factor. We know that human decisions can turn risks into opportunities, and opportunities into risks. Um, this is true at the company level, where a strategic decision, uh, for example, in the face of a change in technology, uh, can determine the future of the company. It's true at the political level, where the decision of people to say yes or no, to answer yes or no at a question in a referendum, is uh, decisive for the future of a country. It's also true at the level of a head of state who's got his finger on the nuclear button and can decide to push it or not. It's also true at the level of a government's decision to apply certain standards of caution in the face of uh, technological revolutions. And as you know, humans are pretty hard to predict. Uh, they create uncertainties. The, the future is difficult to anticipate. And this is why we uh, think uh, you have to react to these changes with agility. And this is really our theme here at COFAS. We want to be the most agile global credit insurer in the industry. We're here to help you better understand the risks that are out there, the opportunities for growth that present themselves, and to deal with them in the best possible way. And uh, using our unique infrastructure we have 80 million companies in our database which I think make it one of the most finely meshed uh, in pieces of infrastructure in this industry in the world. As I said, we serve 50,000 global clients of all sizes, of all sectors, at any time, and we accompany them in taking risk in over 200 markets, and, uh, and many of you here are, are know what we do uh, in, in this space. So we're working hard to become the most agile uh, global credit insurance partner that you can have in the industry. We will continue to be here for you to help you and guide you in understanding the risks 
and opportunities that present themselves to you, making the right decisions for your business, develop simple solutions, better segment our offer to the needs of your specific industries or your size or ge geography of your business, we're committed to improving our client service, which means being faster in the response times, decisions. Um, and then uh, we're committed to continuing to support you through the digital transformation that you're experiencing, that we are experiencing as well, making sure our products become much more available through these digital tools. So this is what we're here to do. I'm, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. I've said enough. It's time for me now to hand it over to Zhu Haibin for his speech on the Chinese economy. Thank you very much, and I wish you a great COFAS 2018 conference.